This morning's reading is from Acts 2, verses 42 to 47, and can be found in the Church Bibles on page 1094 if you wish to follow it there. New pages are terrible. Right. Fellowship in the believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the numbers daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Father God, we just thank you for what for us this morning. And I just pray that we will just be open to receive it into our hearts and to go forward with it according to what you talk to us about today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I'll be <laughs> Try again. Yeah, carry on. Okay, I've been told to carry on. Before you panic, this isn't my sermon notes. Um, We're not going to be here for hours and hours. Um, what this is, is it's a handout of the, the presentations that I've used the last four, on, the, on our four nights of the vision. So I'll put them at the back of church. Um, do take them if you want to. If you weren't here, they might not make much sense. I will get some notes out to go with them to explain the slides and explain what we talked about as well. And that'll be done so within the next week or two. Um, we'll get those out by email. And if you're not on email, I'll also get um, paper copies to you if you'd like. There's also um, a, a, health, a health check survey, if you like. Now, I'm, I'm not such a fan of questionnaires, but it's, it is a good way of getting information in. Apologies for those of you who are here over the weeks. I know you've heard me talk about this quite a lot. Um, if you haven't got one, please take one. Please fill it in. Don't spend hours on it. Pray about it. Fill it in. Doesn't matter if it all comes. If you think it's really negative, one thing I've been pleased about this week is there has been some conversations that that haven't been positive, but they've been constructive. And if I if I was stood here and all the conversations I'd had this week had been positive, I'd be saying, right, what you're not telling me. <laughs> so put on here the space for you to write some questions in, uh, space for you to write some answers in. I've said it before, I won't be offended with whatever you write. So feel free to write what you think. You can do it anonymously. You can put your name on it. It's entirely up to you. And there's a red box at the back of church. You can put them in when, when, when you've finished. But it has been a, uh, a really, really long week in some ways. Um, sorry, could I have my PowerPoint up, please? Thanks, Chris. Um, it has, in some ways, felt a really long week. Um, you know, it's, it's been a tiring week. It has been tiring going through this vision process. But as I said last week, these things take commitment. And we need to have that commitment. And it's not the end of it by any means. But we've spent time together. We've worshipped the Lord. We've prayed into the vision. We've had lots of different words and pictures that have come up in, in the week. Some were encouraging, quite a lot were encouraging. There were two or three that were quite challenging that we need to pray into and see, well, actually, what's God actually saying to us through this? Where are we going on this journey? What did that mean? I've spent time this week thinking and starting to reflect on the vision and the priorities that we'll set as a church going forward. I'm really excited to see what comes out of it in the following few months. And if you've been reading Acts, a chapter a day, as we started last Monday, then you'll be up to chapter 7 today. Now, I'm already two days behind, confession. I will catch up later on today. But I really like spending time in the book of Acts. 
It's been difficult, we, as, I, as I said last week, we'll be spending some time looking at Acts through our services on a Sunday morning. It's been really difficult choosing a little block of Acts to focus on on a Sunday morning. Because I think rather than spending four or five weeks on it, we could spend a year on it and still not be anywhere near the end. So it's been really hard to choose which bits we're going to look at on a Sunday and on a Wednesday. But it is a good book to be studying as we seek the vision, to take us back to the early church, to take us back to what it was like with the apostles. In many ways, Acts serves as a sequel to Luke's gospel, which we read through Advent. It shows us the beginnings of the church and how the apostles carried on the work that they'd started when Jesus was with them. It begins with that reminder of the ascension, of Jesus ascending to heaven. It carries on with Matthias being chosen to replace Judas. We get the wonderful reading in Acts at the start of Acts 2 of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes and the tongues of fire descend on the apostles. The Holy Spirit is poured out amongst all believers. Straight after that, we've Peter addressing the crowd, telling them to repent and be baptized. And then just before the reading we had today, we're told that about 3,000 were added to the number. Can you imagine 3,000 people coming to faith in one go? That's about half the size of our parish. When you think of it that way, that's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. It's really exciting. They were all coming to faith because they'd heard what Peter had said. Peter, the same apostle who we know had denied Jesus three times. Peter, the apostle who kept getting things wrong. Peter, the one whom we often associate with because he asks those questions that we want to ask ourselves. Well, if Peter can do these things, if Peter can bring, can speak and bring 3,000 to faith by the Holy Spirit working through him, that gives us hope that we can do it. But of course, we're not all called to be like Peter. We're not all called to stand up and speak, to preach in front of big crowds. We're not all called to stand at the front and lead services. We're not all called to serve in every way. And over the past week, as we've been looking and praying into the vision, we've explored the different ways that we all fit into that vision. And this season is as much about exploring where we're going as a church corporately as where we're going individually. If we lose ourselves in this process, then we failed. If we lose the corporate vision, then we failed. If we lose a vision that involves the community, we failed. So there's a lot of places where we can slip up in this, in this process. But we need to make sure that we are all counted in this, bill, in this congregation, in this church. We need to make sure we've got something together corporately and something for the outside. You remember that slide that I had up last week. But once the vision is launched, it then... It then gives us something that we can go through and everything we do then links into that. Why are we doing this? Why are we, do, why are we doing family church? Well, it's because it links into the vision here. Why are we doing Thirst Cafe? Because it links into the vision here. Why do we do Mustard Seed? Because it links into the vision here. It gives us something that we can keep looking back to. And each and every element of the church, no matter what it is, all comes under that vision. Each and every one of us contribute. On Thursday evening, um, I shared with those that as we, we need to make a mind shift as we carry on in this process. It's like I started thinking about the, the old joke that what's the similarity between helicopters and the church? Well, the closer you get to them, the more rotors you're on. <laughs> but we need to get a mind shift out of, well, it's my turn, it's my duty because I'm on the rotor this week. We need to get out of that mindset of being, it's a duty, but into the mindset of this is ministry. Each and every rotor that we have in this church serves a different ministry. Standing up and reading from the Bible in a church service on a Sunday morning is ministry. Serving the tea and coffee is ministry. 
Hoover in the building is ministry. It's not just, oh, it's my turn, I'm on the rotor. So we need to shift that mindset from it being a duty to being ministry. That way we know we're serving one another and we're serving God. Without thinking yesterday, I just started writing a list. Who was involved in the activities in this building today? And without really thinking, I hit 20 people. If I thought, I'd have probably got far more. That's how many people are involved in ministry today. On one morning. That's fantastic. That doesn't even think about all the different ministries that we have going through the week at this church. It is important, is ministry, and we all have a role in it. At the start of our reading today, Luke records what happens to those 3,000 new believers. In verse 42 alone, there are four activities listed in which they take part. They're sometimes regarded as four separate things, but I think we need to look at them for what characterized a Christian gathering in the early church. And friends, we'll see the similarities Firstly, there was teaching. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. So it was a learning church. Secondly, there's fellowship. It was a loving church. There was breaking of the bread. Luke's term for what Paul calls the Lord's Supper. It reminds us of what Jesus did at the Last Supper. And also when he fed the multitudes earlier in the gospel. And there was prayer. It was a worshipping church. And there was witness. It was an evangelistic church as well. So if we look at the list, those four things, are not much different to the fundamentals of church today. Each aspect is as important as the other. We've teaching in church. We are a learning church. It's an essential part of our journey. No matter how often we've read those passages in scripture, most of the time we pick something new up. When we hear it again, or we hear a different talk and we hear somebody else speaking on it, it's the Holy Spirit that's helping us to interpret interpret it and to receive that teaching on scripture. Hopefully the teaching we receive builds us up. It builds our faith up. It helps us to live it out through the week. It's no good thinking, oh, well, that's great for a Sunday, but now I'm going back to my my everyday week. No, the teaching we hear should impact all of our lives. In about a week, I think the Church of England are launching something called Everyday Faith, which is looking at how do we live out our discipleship in the everyday? How does what I learn at church on a Sunday impact me on Monday? and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and so on. We hear in the, gospel, in the passage that the church stuck to the apostles' teaching. And at the end of the passage, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Is this perhaps one reason why we hear of the church today being in decline? Those churches who've deviated away from the apostles' teaching. Worth a thought. When you look at the stats, those churches that stick to the biblical teaching are the churches that are growing. The churches that are deviating away from scripture are the churches that are in decline. There must be a reason for that. The apostles' teaching has been passed on through the New Testament so that the spirit-filled church is a New Testament church. The spirit of God leads the people of God to submit to the word of God. There's fellowship in church. We are a loving church. We share with one another. We spend time with one another. We get to know one another. We support one another. We weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. The society that we live in now is so much about the individual and what's in it for me that we've lost that community spirit. We lack togetherness despite the fact the population is growing. We don't spend time together anymore. We're too busy at work. Or when we get home, we're too glued to our technology and our devices. 
What's happened to the family meal each night where we all come back from different, uh, different um, school, work, whatever we've been doing? We sit down and we say, how was your day? How often when that happens are other people just sat there playing on their phones rather than engaging in that conversation? Fellowship is important with each other. In the family at home, in the family of church, it is really important that we spend time together. Some of the things that have come out this week are, are we doing enough social stuff together? I've heard it from about three or four different people. Are we gathering and sharing with one another and just socializing, getting to know each other rather than coming to church on a Sunday, having a coffee and going home? But as well as being that fellowship where we love each other, we need to be a welcoming fellowship. We need to be able to welcome people in. I shared on Thursday, if somebody walks through the door, do we look at them and go, oh, well, you're different. You don't belong here. Or do we look at them and go, welcome. It's so good to have you with us. Would you like a tea or coffee? This is where we meet for worship. Introduce yourself. Talk to people that come through the door. I know we do it. I know that I've heard from different people that we we are a welcoming church. But let's continue to build on that and develop that. It's a fractured world that we live in. It needs to see church communities witnessing to the reality of substantially restored human relationships because of the gospel. That's what people are looking in. That's what people need to see. Our first impressions to people can be very important. It may be that if we are not welcoming, that person never steps foot through the door again. That's a soul lost. Hopefully they'll go to another church. Hopefully they will still find Jesus. But we need to make sure that as people come through our doors, we welcome them, we show them the love of Jesus. Whether they're a believer or not, we show them the love of Jesus. It doesn't matter. There are no qualifications for coming to church. If somebody walks through that door, we say, welcome. We don't ask them. We don't give them 10 questions and say, well, do you believe? How long have you believed? Are you baptized? No, we just say, welcome. We are a loving church. Are we like this cartoon, which made me chuckle this week? I understand you're newcomers. Welcome. Slow glad you're here. By the way, you're in my pew. (laughs) Substitute pew for seat. Do we have our own seats in this church? Do we get upset if somebody sits in our seat? Or do we think, oh well, I'll go and sit somewhere else and talk to somebody else. Of course, there is the breaking of the bread. A very significant part of our faith is doing what Jesus did and reminding ourselves of the importance and the significance of breaking the bread. What does the liturgy say? Though we are many, we are one body. Because we all share in one bread. Now I actually really like Rowan Williams' explanation of Holy Communion. What he says when he approaches a communion in his book Being Christian, which is actually quite an easy read for Rowan's writing. But he says that as he comes to the communion rail, he pauses, takes a moment, looks to the left, looks to the right and thinks, this is it. This is it is what it looks like. This is what the church is. All together as one. It doesn't matter if I am perhaps don't agree with that person to my left or to my right. But we are all receiving the, the bread and the wine together. It's that moment of eternity which me, reaches down into, onto earth. So we know, friends, that taking communion is an important part of our faith. That's why it's reminded to us in scripture as we carry on through the New Testament. Of course, we pray. We pray in church. We've been gathering the last four nights. AFM, who use our building, have been gathering. They've got ten nights of prayer. Putting us to shame. But they've been gathering and they've been meeting and praying too. As we have done. And I know it's not just those two churches that have been meeting to pray. Every church is a praying church. Prayer is, of course, fundamental to our Christian life, to our journey. It's as essential as water and food is to our bodies. Prayer and reading scripture is as essential to the Christian life. 
That's all from the first verse of our reading today. That's all those four points from that, read, from those, uh, from that verse. But as an outcome of that, what do we see? Well, we hear of the apostles doing signs and wonders and people filled with awe. The supernatural power of God is shown here and throughout Acts and the New Testament. And we have that same supernatural power of God living in each one of us today. It's the Holy Spirit. I know that some branches of the church think that signs and wonders ended with the apostles, but it's simply not the case. Signs and wonders can and do happen in this day and age. Some of us, I'm sure, will have seen things happen that are beyond explanation, but we know it's God. But the caveat is always we don't go seeking after them. We don't go seeking after them. They are an outworking of the Holy Spirit living in us. They're the mighty works of God. And it's not that they work through that person but not that person. It's not about the person. It's about the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that causes these things to happen. And we're on dangerous ground when we start saying, well, that person can do signs and wonders. No, they can't. That person can only do signs and wonders because of the Holy Spirit living in them and they're not seeking them. They are just seeking to be a faithful disciple of the Lord. So we don't go searching for them. But as we carry on into Acts 3, we read of Peter, of course, healing the crippled beggar at the temple. And as I've just said, it wouldn't be Peter that healed. It was the name of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that healed the beggar. He jumps to his feet and walks. The apostles are dedicated to those four points we've just looked at, the four points of a of church. So how does all that fit together for us at Christ Church in 2020 as we seek the Lord's vision? Well, we need to make sure that we've got, um, that we've got those four elements of the early church. We need to make sure that we're practicing things daily. That our prayer and our reading of scripture is as important to us as food and water is to our bodies. I know we all go through seasons where it's not that easy. I've been through them myself where I've stopped praying or I've stopped reading the Bible. It happens to all of us. Don't feel guilty if you're in that season at the moment. Pray about it. Or if you can't pray on your own, pray with a friend. Pray with somebody in this church. Because it's in those times when we're struggling with faith that we need the fellowship of each other. It's how we show we're a loving church. If you're not able to pick your Bible up and read at the moment, well, the rest of us are doing that and we're, doing it. we're, we're supporting you through that. We're carrying you through. That's one of the beauties of the church and the bond of the Holy Spirit between us, that we can carry those of our brothers and sisters who perhaps are struggling. But it is really important. And it should be for, it may be for us for a season. But we get back to it. We get back to that discipline of prayer and reading scripture. Because prayer is really important in all that we do. That's why we try, and, we try and encourage prayer ministry to take place each week. It's biblical to pray for one another. It's biblical to lay hands on one another. Assuming people want that. Obviously you can say no. You don't have to have lay hands on. It doesn't mean God's not going to work just because you've not got your hand on somebody's shoulder. But when we pray, we expect things to happen. But it doesn't matter if we don't see those things happen straight away. I have permission to share this. In, at New Wine in 2016, Amanda was prayed for. And we came away from that, from that week and thought, well, nothing happened. Oh, well, let's carry on. It wasn't until 18 months later that Amanda looked at me and went, you know that thing we prayed for at New Wine? It hasn't happened. It doesn't necessarily happen instantly. And if it doesn't happen instantly, it doesn't mean that you haven't received an answer to your prayer. And actually, the instantaneous and the miraculous are actually a very, very small part of answers to our prayer. Most of the time, we won't see an answer, but God will have heard and God will answer. Because we can't see the whole picture. We can't see the whole picture for our own lives. We can't see the whole picture for the world. 
That's why we need to seek his will, seek the Lord's vision for this church. Because we won't see the full picture. We'll just see our little bit of it. But we can trust the Lord and know that he's guiding us on with what we're doing. As I said at the start, I've had some really, really good conversations with people this week. I've had those conversations that are really constructive. I think we need to do this. We need to do more of that. That will hopefully feed into the next steps on this journey. And if you haven't been able to join in this week, for whatever reason, don't feel you're not able to share that. Come and see me anyway and talk about it. It's really important that we carry on these conversations so that we know which way we need to go. It's likely there will be more, uh, more gatherings, whether it's a gathering just to have a conversation, to actually spend time talking to each other about, well, what do you feel we need to do in Christ church? What do you feel we need to do? Have that time to talk. That will be happening as we move on. But if there's something on your heart this morning, don't be afraid to tell me. If you think it's negative, please don't be afraid to tell me. As I've said, if I was only hearing positive things, then I'd be worried. Because that isn't the truth. Let's just be honest with each other. Things are never, ever perfect. And the moment that a church becomes perfect is the moment I think we need to step back and go, well, what are we doing wrong? Because the moment the church becomes perfect is the moment we're not relying on God. And that is dangerous. If we don't know about the things that we need to put right, how are we supposed to try and correct them? Next week, um, there will hopefully be some more, um, some prayer cards and leaflets that will be coming out with a prayer on that we've used during this week, Living God's Love Prayer, the diocesan strap line. And it's a prayer that I would like us to adopt as we carry on on this process. We've used two prayers this week, one from leading your church into growth and this, the Living God's Love Prayer. And I want to try and get, make sure that every person has a copy of that. So they will hopefully be coming out next week that we can then use as part of our prayer on this vision journey. But going back to our reading, we hear of those in the early church pooling their resources and selling possessions to give to anyone in need. It's quite a challenging verse or verses. It's, it's hard to read that. But commentators agree that we're not all called to that life. Clearly, some people are called to that way of living. But the sharing in Jerusalem at the time, the sharing of property and possessions was voluntary. It's more likely, according to commentators, that selling and giving was occasional and in response to particular needs. But the message to take from this is that we as Christians are all called to be generous, especially towards the poor and the needy. Because Christian fellowship is Christian caring. And Christian caring is Christian sharing. The Acts church that we read of was a worshipping church. As we've said, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and prayer. Their devotion to each other was not only expressed in their caring for one another, but corporately too. The early church was both formal and and informal. So that's quite small. Uh, it was both formal and informal. They had regular meetings together. The formal, if you like, the church service on a Sunday. The informal, when they met in their houses. That's what it tells us in the passage. Is that why the stats show that churches that have small groups are the churches that are growing? Because it's based on the Acts church. It's right there in Acts chapter 2. We need to break bread together and we need to share together. It says in the temple and in, they broke bread in their homes. It's right there in scripture. But our worship in whatever context, it needs to be joyful and reverent. The great John Stott tells us that every worship service should be a joyful celebration of the mighty acts of God through Jesus Christ. He also says that public worship should be dignified. And, the one I like, it's unforgivable to be dull. Our worship should not be dull. It should be energizing. It should be joyful. It's a challenge for us as we journey on. 
Are we making sure that in our worship, and it's not just the sung worship, it's our whole attitude of worship, are we making sure that we're joyfully celebrating the mighty acts of God through Jesus Christ in the right way? Are we making sure that what we do is not classed as dull, but classed as joyful? So our hearts should be thankful to the Lord for all that he's done. Lastly, the church, the early church, was an evangelistic church. All of which we've looked at so far, the loving, the learning, and the worshiping, that's all quite internal. It's looking inside the church. But we know it can't just do that. We have to look outwards. And actually, that's where this this passage does show a good lesson of not taking a text from Scripture out of context. Because if you just look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42, you think, well, that's the church. But you need to have the outside looking outside as well. The church doesn't function solely based on its internal life. Verse 47b, which says, the people were being saved daily and added to the number daily. The first Christians didn't forget about witnessing to the world. Excuse me. We can't forget about witnessing to the world. The Holy Spirit is a missionary spirit who's created a missionary church. We have to be those witnesses to the world and show people what it means to be a Christian. What it means to have a living, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. What we learn through this passage is that the Lord added to the number, not us. It's not about what we do, it's about what the Lord does. The Lord is saving people and adding them to church at the same time. It's not one before the other. Salvation and church membership belong together in the early church just as much as they belong together now. And the Lord added people daily. It's beyond doubt that the church grew daily as it's written right here in the word of God. But it reminds us that the church's missional activity then was not occasional or sporadic. It was daily. And in many ways, I think we need to get back to the idea of our outreach and our mission being a continuous activity as that will lead to converts being added daily to our number through the Holy Spirit working in each of us. Our church growth should be steady and and uninterrupted. So it's fine to spend time focusing on church growth and having these prayer evenings, but actually church growth should be the very fundamental part of our DNA along with those other aspects we've talked about. In the same way that daily reading of scripture and our daily prayer life is part, it should become part of our DNA, our outreach and our mission should also, and our church focus on church growth. So we need to recapture, I think, I believe, some of the early church as described in these few short verses of Acts. We need to be concerned with the church's relationships, not just between ourselves and God, but between ourselves and each other, sorry, between each other. Not just between ourselves and God, but between each other. In fellowship and love, between ourselves inside the church, and in fellowship and love with those outside the church. God has already poured out his Holy Spirit on each and every one of us. Our responsibility is to humble ourselves before the Lord and allow him his freedom to do what he wants to do. If we do this, if we humble ourselves before the Lord, The church will again manifest the marks of the Spirit's presence, which so many people are desperately seeking for. I firmly believe that there's so many people out there that are dabbling in things like the occult because they don't know that it's the Holy Spirit that they're missing in their life. We can show them that that hole, that spiritual hole that they are seeking for is found in Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit living in us. So many people are desperately seeking that in the world. So we can be spirit-filled. This is the the church that I want to be a part of. I want it to be spirit-filled with biblical teaching, with a loving fellowship, with living worship, with ongoing and outgoing evangelism. That's the church that can be attractive to the outside. That's the church that can be attractive to the inside. That's the church where the Holy Spirit and the Lord can have his way. And I believe that's what we can become. Amen.